And we're back. Yeah. Uh, welcome back to the Box to Box, everyone. Hey. My name's Harry. I'm Thomas. And I'm Max. All right. Let's talk soccer. Yeah? Let's just let's, jump right into it. What's going on, guys? Um, oh. My starting topic yeah. is Hakimi. Hakimi. I don't know if either of you guys saw those two goals he scored, back-to-back free kicks for Morocco in the AFCON. Mm. I saw the free kick. Unbelievable. Two. I saw but, one. I didn't know it was two. Yeah, the first one was like really good, and then the second one was like yeah, it was unbelievable. Banger, yeah. Did you? Did you yeah, see no, I saw. I saw. I saw the. Uh, do you see the joke there? Like, yeah, I'm gonna have to talk to Messi and Neymar to take over duties at PSG. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do the free kicks. Or whatever. Um, but, well, so my kind of building point. Your point is Akimi good. He's good. Well, yes. Well, so is he good? Is he the best right back in the world? Maybe. Yeah. But did. Chelsea miss out when they didn't sign him over the summer. Because mm. if you remember last okay, summer, he did right now. it was almost like, you know, Fabrizio was about to say, here we go. Yeah. Uh, Fabrizio for, was mid-text. <laughs> mid-tweet. Fabrizio had that in his notes, like, locked right, right yeah. now. Yeah, he, did, he had it saved. It was a draft. It was a draft. It didn't happen. So. Um, I don't think so. I think that would have been, that would have, uh, he would have become the starter because he has um, experience at, a large club and I think Reese James has continued to be um, one of the best probably we were talking earlier um, like two episodes ago that Reese James was the second best in the world behind Trent yeah. and Akimi is good he's older he's probably more of a fleshed out player in terms of his technical abilities but I I think it would be it would make more sense to get like a, a younger not even younger just like a um that's not there, we have a lot more weaknesses in our team and I think it's just like we have Asby at right back I don't think that's yeah. the the real struggle on our team right now well he's rumored with Barcelona now I, know. That? That's like I very, thought that was like confirmed it's like very close yeah, yeah I think it's like basically confirmed but which is um, just alright he's been his last few games have been fun he's been, enjoyed some form but like yeah. overall this season he's looked slower yeah. and he just hasn't looked the same um, which is surprising like Barcelona still want to have him I guess it, he'll go back to Spain and maybe yeah. it'll rejuvenate him yeah, yeah. we'll see yeah. I was excited to see Mario Balotelli back oh, in the yeah. Italian team uh, for right. the first time in like what three four years or maybe even longer than that yeah but like I feel like he was, like, so controversial for, like, no reason. He was, like, almost exiled from the team like Benzema was from France. But, like, he's, like, 32 now. Like, I remember this guy, like, as a kid. And now he's, like, back on the team. So, like, I was super (laughs) excited to see that, like, this week. What's Italy doing? Because they're not... Oh, they're playing... I guess they're just training for the the playoffs. Yeah, they need to... Yeah, they need to put a squad together for the playoffs and also i think mancini was looking at like what he's going to do with insigne because he's going to be playing oh. in the mls now oh so and that they don't have I, the same breaks i don't I, think they i do. think they do have the same breaks but like i don't know if he thinks like is his form gonna drop is he still yeah. gonna be like part of the squad yeah like, but it's not like bellatelli's in flying I, form either. I, know. I think he plays Where somewhere in turkey uh, in super super liga or whatever yeah. But huh. Balotelli's apparently a really like good guy. He just like he donates a lot of his money to charity, and he's like a good guy. But he gets ostracized because of that that one video of him playing in the. Remember he was on Man City. He play, was playing like the MLS All Stars. <laughs> yeah. he, he was through on goal. He tried to like Rabona. He had a Rabona. It was, like, it was like the spin, tried to, like, spin, spin, oh, spin yeah, back yeah, hill. Yeah. <laughs> he got taken off. It was hilarious. I think. I think Mancini was the yeah he was the, the coach, coach at that City. time really? too for yeah. City yeah, <laughs> yeah that's um, funny actually yeah, yeah that's crazy um, what about Martial to Sevilla I mean Sevilla's like good right they're Sevilla's, second place yeah. I mean they have right? like a kind of a shot at La Liga yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if Martial's the answer honestly yeah I haven't like been impressed him, I would like to see him you know playing I think that's good for him I think it's good for him. I think Manchester United thought like Martial was going to be this monster, and unfortunately for him, it just didn't pan out that way. Yeah. Right. And this, I feel like Man United have a lot of players on their bench that have a lot of quality. I was watching today Ivory Coast versus Egypt. Um, Eric Bailly was one of the best players on the pitch, and he doesn't play for Man United. He yeah. plays like every five games. Mm-hmm. Um, so as much as 
those those players have quality. They were bought by Manchester United when they were on t- like <clears throat> smaller teams performing really well. Um, and I I hope Martial finds his form again. It's it's tough to go to Man United. A lot of careers kind of stagnate once mm-hmm. you reach there. Um, yeah, Sanchez, but like, Beek. also daily daily blind daily blind. Uh, we'll talk later about PSV Ajax, but yeah. he was on Man United for a few years, and now he's he's doing great in um, Eredivisie. So yeah. yeah, we'll see. How is Eric Bailly supposed to play when Harry Maguire's on the team? Is that <laughs> he's just never going to take Linda that. Lindelof is just has <laughs> that just lockdown. Yeah. The, the yeah. talent on that team. That is true. Hey, Phil Jones making his uh, making his appearances. Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of United, I saw. Um, Donny van de Beek rumored to Newcastle which I feel like has been kind of on everyone's mind as soon as Newcastle got their money right I would like to see that that'd be pretty cool I think it was just yeah. a lone move but um, I'd love to see him like getting some time you know yeah I think it's like Newcastle's like providing a lot of these players that are like at a standstill in their career and they're not like it's hit or miss it's, it's like not they're close to retirement but they're at like the 28 to like 30 range where they're still good but they're not getting the playing time at their like clubs now. They actually they today they oh it's close. I thought they confirmed it. They got this guy Bruno Gumieres from, from uh, Leon. Leon. Yeah, and he's like twenty four and one of the mm. premier young talents in the um, top five league. So Brazilian player. Yeah, I think yeah. It's Brazilian. That's the first player that I've seen that's like a you know seems like an up and coming guy. Whereas right. players like uh, Kieran Trippier, it's kind of like okay, you know he. Has maybe two or three good years left in him, mm-hmm. or maybe more than that. He's not that old, but it's like, t- like they're in their prime versus like right, this approaching seems like their a player prime. for the future. Right. Yeah. Remember la- last week we were talking about like Liverpool and Man City's transfers and their top ten transfers, how they like form their teams. You look at like the age when they were transferred to those teams. It's like twenty two to twenty four exclusively with like mm-hmm. some older players. But like if you want to build a team with like young quality talent, you get like when. Especially those like bigger teams that are, can afford to buy these um, slightly older players, like twenty, like twenty one to twenty four. That's how you build like a strong team. And Newcastle is now the richest club in the world. So by we, far, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think so we're, we're gonna have to get used to like players like this has gotten to get swept, swept up by Newcastle. Yeah, and I think also their, I would imagine their, you know, tactic is to buy some younger players, um, like they did or will do. Um, but then also these like a little bit older players, kind of more in their prime or kind of struggling, mm-hmm. especially on loans, so they don't have to take on their full wages or yeah. on shorter contracts, so they can get them for a couple of years, because they just like they need need to build a team. <laughs> they need to fight off regulation. Do they, right now. they need to like. <laughs> do they have a coach? Like yeah, for they have a, a the future. I guess no, they have Eddie Howe right now. I don't know who their coach for the future is, but yeah, they need to like build a team first. They need to be at least mid table. Yeah. Um, they can't just rely on John Joe Shelby, as, <laughs> as good as he is. Yeah, he scored. <laughs> oh, yeah, he, he won the game. For him. Yeah. T- at least a tie. No, I think you won it. Yeah. John um, Joe Shelby is yeah, one, of the, one of the best players. I, I think Rupert. we all want to make sure and want to see Newcastle in like the first league, in the Premier League. It would be so sad if they, for some reason, got relegated. Oh, well, I kind of also, no, want, to I also want to see that. Yeah. Because oh, then they're in the championship gosh. with like crazy with players. So much money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So fun. I'm sure... It would be only one season, but it'd be fine. Yeah, it would be one season. Yeah, that, actually, that would yeah, be. Yeah, I would see crazy. Jesse Lingard yeah. like destroying in the championship. Mm-hmm. That'd be pretty fun. Except he would hate that. But oh well. Um, all right. We, yeah. Should, should we, we do want to recap the? Let's do yeah match of the week. Yeah. Um, for those of you who saw last week, our match of the week was um, Ajax versus PSV. Uh, Sorry, you missed out, Tommy. Yeah. But yeah Harry like, and I scored on this one. Max and I both. Easily predicted Ajax winning. Um, now they're taking top of the lead. That ball was out. That ball no, was out actually, of bounds. Actually, I don't think it was. It looked like it was. Like it looked like it because you could see the grass in between. Yeah, but it was the camera ball. angle, yeah. and they couldn't. Yeah, I did. But, te- I did text in the group chat. I was like, um, I think yeah. that ball was out, but it was close. Tom, were you asleep for that? Yeah, I was asleep. <laughs> I rewatched the game uh, today because it was seven a.m. It was seven a.m. We. I was watching. Well, that, me actually, and Harry had some beers the night before. Tom was, was asleep on the couch. I was asleep. It was 7 a.m. It was like, I watched the first half, but I also didn't really remember that much. So I rewatched the whole game. What a oh, tactical man. battle Dude, that I, I did. I loved yeah, that game. That was actually an incredible game. 
Tommy and I were talking about, and I don't know if it was just that game or if that's just how they play in the Air Divise, but it was, it was so like beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was, it was so like fluid. There was so much like space on the field just because everyone was so <laughs> spread out. And I love the way they played with uh, like Lissandro Martinez. I think he was playing center back for them, which yeah. I normally think of him as a, like a defensive midfielder. But he was playing yeah. center back, and would just kind of post up, kind of in the center of the field where Thiago Silva sometimes is, mm. and everyone would just like go as far as they can, yeah, and he would just like ping balls to like <coughs> everywhere. And I think what the biggest thing I noticed about their play style, and I think this is something Chelsea does not do well, is they every like pass they made had a purpose, whereas Chelsea a lot of times will recycle it and they play very slow. But Ajax was playing with so much like purpose you know they every ball was like okay if i play it there it'll maybe get a chance or get close to it um yeah, so yeah i think yeah. chelsea need to watch more i think this when the ball went <laughs> that's true so well, well, <laughs> ball went to the fullbacks or just like when on chelsea if the ball goes to the wing backs a lot of times they have to turn back Ajax would like hold the ball between their center mids and alvarez the the, the more defensive mid until they like could see that oh when we passed the ball to either Daily Blend or Daily Blend or Maserati, it was on the other side, or sometimes Maserati would like cut inside, be inverted, and let Anthony run into mm-hmm. that space. They did that like three or four times, immediate build up, and every single time the ball got to one of those guys, they would be most of the time in in on goal, or, or like the ball would be in a crossing situation mm-hmm. within a couple seconds. Mm-hmm. They didn't so crowd true. each other, which I think yeah. is some t- something. Um, I'm just thinking of Chelsea because obviously we watch a good amount of Chelsea, but yeah. they, you know, Ajax were so good about like spreading out and letting players like, you know, do what they wanted to express their creativity while also still relying on each other. There was still a system; it wasn't yeah. free for all, but they kind of spread out and really right. like utilized the whole field. Yeah, I was jealous. They watching played that. to right now. the individual strengths. I feel like like player oh, yeah. individual strengths, and then still played as a team. I mean. I feel like they picked up exactly like I don't watch Air Derby's at all, but like Champions League when I when we see like Ajax playing like how they destroyed like Dortmund and like they score all these goals. Um, that's like exactly how we saw them play against PSV. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So like I was rooting for PSV a little bit because I I have my because you picked the losers. I have my <laughs> yeah. my word to back up, you know. But Ajax definitely deserved to win, um, and. One th- well, other thing I wanted to point out, which I was so jealous of when, as a Chelsea fan, is when they got up to the, the like into crossing positions or just like at that um, that like final like PSV was a final like block, the center mids would really try to push that defense, and the ball wasn't being like when Chelsea gets there, um, it's like Jorginho <laughs> is still cycling the ball. Mm. Versus when they're all up, they had literally two players cycling the ball. They had two center backs. Everyone else was either like crowding the area where the ball was, so in order to like create some one twos, and that allowed. Well, I think the, the first goal what was named Brabri. Bra- what was his name? Yeah. He got injured. Brabri. He was like uh, it was a two on two in the box because the rest of PSV's defenders were really sucked into the. Oh, there's a, a, sh- a bunch of movement around <laughs> I didn't <answer. laughs> I don't know I was just like, very impressed and I was very jealous of the fact that they yeah. pushed a lot of players above and yeah. that they didn't like they weren't conservative with it yeah I agree we should all start watching more A to V's I guess yeah watching more it also makes me want to watch more of them in the Champions League because um, yeah. a lot of times you know there's another game on and I'll default to one of those other ones but it makes me want to watch more Ajax yeah. so we need to watch Ajax because Tommy has them predicted in the final yeah right? was a, yeah yeah so I hedged my my bet of PSV with Ajax <laughs> going to the final <laughs> yeah perfect yeah well um do we want to cover maybe match of the week for this week and yes international break yeah, yeah international break so this week we're going to do uh old faithful U.S. men's <laughs> national team versus Canada up north USA, um, USA on Sunday. USA light, as we like to call them. Yes, up there. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> up north. Yeah. Um, USA light. Yeah. All I right. Just, you want to start us off? Wait, with uh, yeah, start with your prediction or. Uh, I think the U.S. should win this. I think this is actually their last game for like the battle of the group. I think like the winner of this 
will most likely win the group. Yeah. And I think Canada's first right now. I know they each have like a game. I think tomorrow, Thursday, too. But no Davies for Canada, and he usually contributes a lot offensively. They still have Jonathan David, and I think that other striker who I'm blanking on right now, Claire or Claire or something, something like that. But I don't know. Um, I, don't know I think the U.S. should teams. win. They have like probably their strongest squad besides Gio Reyna. Um, I bet the U.S. win like one zero. Honestly, yeah. I think one zero is like. Reasonable. Reasonable, I feel like. Yeah, I also have the best winning. I have, I'm thinking the score is going to be 2-1. Um, Canada are, like, they're a good team. You mm-hmm. know, I think Canada have impressed me. Um, one thing that I do think plays into the U.S.'s favor is how they have been playing kind of in the qualifiers so far, and they have been turning up for the big games. They've been playing well under pressure. They've been flooding, like, the easy games against... You know, I don't know. Jamaica, I, Yeah, right? Jamaica, I think Jamaica they lost. Draw. Yeah. A draw, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe they haven't lost yet, but I think they have yeah. a couple draws that really shouldn't be. So yeah. that's one thing that I think works in their favor, at least for this Canada game, is the fact that they have been showing up for the bigger events. Um, and it seems like they have very good like team spirit, which mm-hmm. I think sometimes you know seems like it isn't that much of a factor, but I think... Um, a lot of these players are enjoying playing with the national team, which I think will help them because they'll get fired up for this bigger game. They'll know that they have a ch- shot at top of the table or top of the qualifying mm-hmm. table. Um, so I think that'll definitely work to their advantage. Yeah. Tom, Mr. McKeon. Me. Um, I, like, I really want to go against you guys because that's more fun, but I am an American, you know. <laughs> I have... I have my I responsibilities. Have. <laughs> It would be I, treason if you pick Canada. I know, it would be. And I think they're going to win. I think USA... I, I agree that they... I'm more worried about the games against, I think, like El Salvador. El Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah. Partially because we're playing in Columbus, Ohio, and somewhere in like St. John's, Minnesota, or St. Paul, whatever the, the Twin City. Cold. It's going to be snowing in both those cities. I don't I know if it's the, Columbus, but like the, I it's snowing in Canada. We're playing, we're playing, that's why they picked northern cities is because um, we're playing in, we're playing, I don't know, someone in Ohio, then we're going to Canada, and then we're going to oh, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. So they picked like close by, close by so the less travel time. But also, it's kind of dumb to play in like harsh weather against worse teams because it kind of just like makes it a scrappy levels game. It. Yeah. And yeah, like levels the playing field. There's more room for error. Right. So I honestly, it's we are only a point ahead of Panama and Mexico. So it is a very important three games. And to leave up, leave those games up to um, some, like. The weather. tough weather and like yeah. honestly like scrappy games is, yeah. is a little worrisome um there is a fourth spot once it, there's like a playoff fourth yeah. spot i'm pretty sure oh, we're, we're scrappy play, we we're play, scrappy. no very scrappy team we're honestly scrappy. yeah yeah we're, we are scrappy um we play el salvador canada who's the last team uh, yeah, i don't know. know i thought it was just those two games but maybe i'm wrong i um, thought canada was the last one on who knows s- no because they play on sunday they probably have one next week i don't know we can yeah, huh. Oh, so there, Mexico, and okay. Honduras, Honduras on next Wednesday. So, what's your score? Um, I'll go two one, USA over Canada. Mark it in. I'm with Harry. Oh yeah. This is a chance for you to actually, what, take it clearly. Yeah. What's your score, Max? One zero. Actually, I'm break. I'm seceding yeah. from the. My, I'm I do, said it first. Yeah, you, I'll go two zero. New zero. rule. New rule. You can't get the same <laughs> score. <laughs> you better volunteer to speak. Okay, first. I'll go two. Yeah, next next week I get to go first, but. <laughs> 2-0, U.S. men's national team. All right. Well, awesome. All right. Lock it in. Um, all right, let's talk referees. Yes. Tommy, I hear you have some. Umpires, as some we call them. VAR. Yeah. VAR. Video assistant Yeah, so referee. I think like, the reason we've been wanting to talk about this is just because, you know, I feel like when VAR was first kind of being established, I don't know if this is the third year maybe that it's been in the Premier League. Um, I think it's like... I feel like it's felt only like three years, but I, I think, think it's, it's been, been like four longer. or five. Yeah. It, it was weird, though, because, I mean, this is another thing. It was like incorporated in other leagues earlier. Yeah. And then I think the Prem was maybe the last, one of the last leagues to incorporate it, mm-hmm. I feel like. Yeah, well, either way, I feel like the, the question of 
VAR or no VAR is done. Like we're we're past that point. You're gonna have VAR every way, either way. Yeah. Uh, but the question can still be asked, like how to best utilize it. Um, you know, we've seen some weird stuff watching in slow mo where, you know, suddenly no no foul is suddenly a red card or I don't know, all this sort of stuff. So I think what we're gonna try to do is kind of propose our best system or what we think kind of should yeah should try happen. to improve know, some of the more um, controversial elements yeah. of VR right now yeah and put uh, put forth our <laughs> bid for being the FA's yes. consultants on referees in VR yeah. um, this is going to be going straight to the FA um, anyone have any opening thoughts opening remarks Max yeah. I don't know I mean like <laughs> I I honestly like think VAR should not be in the game. Really? And I don't... I'm Maybe I'm not being, like, realistic right now, like, whether or not, like, they're going to remove it or not, because, like, they're probably not going to remove it. Yeah. But I think it destroys, like, what the game of soccer or football is, because the way the game is set up is there's no breaks. Like, 90 minutes, there's no timeouts, there's no, like, they don't stop the time for throw-ins... Um, corners, whatever. In all these other sports in the world where we have like video assistants come in or timeouts and stuff, they're all designed to have these stoppages of play for like players or like different like squads. Like soccer is a very fluid game. Mm -hmm. So like you have the same number of people, you're not making constant subs. And so I feel like the breaks that VAR often provides, like leaves one the players and the fans uncertainty when there's like a call in the field or when there's a goal like every time there's a goal now i'm like well maybe he was offsides yeah. like maybe his armpit was offsides and that was what the premier league tweeted like their official twitter on one of them was like firmino's armpit was offsides like by a millimeter yeah. and stuff so i think so yeah i mean i think that's where like better utilization can come in because I don't think it should be like that. I don't yeah. think you should be like losing your whatever ability to celebrate a goal because you're yeah, so yeah. nervous it might be overturned. But I do think it's well. First of all, I think it's too late. It's so hard to take out now that it's already been put in because yeah. um, you know you see all these fouls that if 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 VR was taken away, you would be watching the game. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's a foul, but there's no way to check it. So that's why I think like at this point it's too late. Um, and I do support it. Um, I think it's good. I mean, I think, you know, like moments like whatever, the hand of God mm -hmm. won't occur anymore. But that's probably Which good. Which is good. <laughs> um, maybe less like. Less exciting, but like. Less no, like, but that's fair. fair. Yeah, fair. yeah, that's yeah, fair. fair. Like, think about like think the, the other team when that happens. Think like, of yeah, um, England, Ireland, yeah. Ireland versus France World Cup qualifiers 1998 or something, where Thierry Henry had a handball in the box and mm -hmm. scored. Ireland couldn't go to the World Cup. And it's just like, like games like that yeah. is obvious errors that are overturned. Yeah. Perfect, perfect time for VR. But I agree that what's problematic about it right now is two minute checks are uh, for whether a fingernail is off sides mm -hmm. um so what do you guys have a solution well, to that yeah so i don't know if you've seen but so this has been like a problem and like last year they talked about it since there was significantly less goals in the premier league because of var mm -hmm. um and so arson wenger like proposed like a new rule kind of mm. saying that instead of you know currently it's like there's a player and you have to be in line with that player or less than yeah but they're saying you can be it's like more like a you can have an arm that's in line with them but you can be in front of them yeah um and you're still on side so i agree it, with that it, it gives should... the like the attacker the advantage right because yeah. that's what it like in practice used to be you know when vr wasn't a thing if you if your head, which is technically a body part that can score a goal, was ahead of another person's body, but the rest of your body was essentially in line, they're not going to call you offsides. Yeah. So in practice, that was the rule, but on paper it wasn't. So that when VR came into effect, that transfer made it um, just like that. 
that goal. Remember the Chilwell goal again in the FA Cup final that got ruled off sides for like inches. Like goals like that just like, oh, yeah. like, piss me off because it's just like he he was onside and before VR. He's onside, and if like you get a referee to watch that play ten ten times, they'll call him offside or onside. Nine times out of ten, because that's like kind of the rule. So yeah. I think yeah, we should. I think the big part would be um, yeah, kind of opening up what offsides is. I feel I feel like so I I think there are a few things. I think Wanger when he said it, he also realized like it's gonna make it so much more difficult for defenders because they're gonna in order to catch people offsides, they're gonna have to play so much higher up. Yeah, and defenders can just like basically sprint through and if like their last body part like their leg is in line with the defender they're onside then with right. that with right. that rule and also so my the other side is with VAR the lines like that that rule basically is like being proposed because VAR is getting these like minuscule like offsides calls they're also talking about like widening those like they lines, did for this year they, they made the line thicker yeah which, which is like I don't know if that's like done anything I guess yeah bit, I don't know but I mean it's still hard know. to tell but I feel like that's like the honestly I think that's like the best system and it seems so like odd yeah but I think that is the best system because that makes it so it's not down to inches but it's still being yeah. enforced it's still making yeah. up for errors and refereeing because that's also the, like no referee is ever going to be perfect um, right and I think like the what is it like offsides rules that that's more easy to solve or at least it's a little bit more concrete because it's more he's onside or he's offside i think where it's harder to make kind of a rule where you used to say oh widen the line or something like that is mm-hmm. with um fouls because mm-hmm. that is still at the end of the day down to the referee and they're you know make their initial call either it's foul no foul or whatever degree the foul is yeah and then when they look at the monitor um you know, they get to kind of remake their decision yeah. in, in slow-mo at different angles. And so it kind of kind of switches everything up. So I think that's kind of where it's a lot more hard to judge yeah. how it should be utilized. I mean, VAR was, like, the reason VAR is there is to overturn, like, very clear and obvious, like, calls that are, like, wrong, you know? And I know a lot of people argued, like, like, yeah, he might be offsides by, like, two millimeters or his shoulders, like, offsides. But is that, like, clear and obvious, like, wrong? Some people are like, well, it's the rule. Like, he's offsides, you know? But, like, some people are like, well, it's, it's not enough. It's not a clear and obvious thing. The foul thing, like, it's so subjective. And I don't know. I mean, we can get into the whole, like, slowing down the frame. Like, seeing, like, okay, this foul looks way worse in slow motion. But in real time, it was bang, bang. And I'm gonna give a yellow card, you know. I think what I mean this would like just a, a proposal. You know, currently there's like four referees: the center ref, the two line judges, and the, the fourth official. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What if they had when they go to do a VAR? You know, they have the fourth official looks at it, and the center ref look at it, and they don't talk to each other, and they both like submit a vote, kind of, or they say, mm-hmm. and unless it's both agreeing, then it doesn't. It's not over change or whatever. That could be kind interesting. of interesting. Yeah, sort of democratic and it's reduces two, it's the a second of, opinion, and also both have to agree. So it's a little bit harder to overturn a foul yeah. unless it is more obvious. It leaves yeah. less room for kind of. But I guess isn't room. that what VAR is now? Because like the ref, usually, usually he says like I I want you to take a look at it because he's only going to have you look at it if he thinks it's a foul. Right, but he has no say in it. It's just the head ref. Yeah, right, but like... So if you have a second party in there, then they can also, if they... It's less down to one person saying, oh yeah, I think that's a foul, or I think it's not a foul. If there's two people, then you... You know, there's less less of a chance that both people are going to agree. Yeah. It just, like, limits... Limits how much stuff will be overturned if there is more wiggle mm-hmm. room, because there's more likely of a chance that they're both not going to agree with a close yeah. call. That's true. I'm, like, very, I'm very against, like, the very, the ambiguity of VAR because I think there are so many times where a ball will be out and, like, like, I'll be like, Harry touched it last. 
or like Harry will be like Max touched it last and two seconds later we're all watching the game and we can see exactly exactly like I was the one that touched the ball last it should be a corner or right. something but VAR is never used for something like that but like in my opinion it takes two seconds for someone to tell the ref like Max touched the ball last that should be a corner like that's a set piece that's a goal scoring opportunity I feel like that takes like two seconds that's what like video should be used goal line technology like that's basically a virtual like that's yeah, I can that's like a technology time. that we're using yeah. you know yeah. so like for throw-ins corners stuff like that where it's like it's either yes or no or in or out I feel like it's a lot easier to use VAR for something like that yeah honestly no I think it, it should if that makes sense it would be easy to do that I think I assume part of the reason they don't have it now is just because they don't want to spend the whole mm -hmm. game looking at a monitor yeah. you know and I think that's part of it why they still have at the end of the day the referee the head ref can make the decision is because they do want there still to be some you know potential human error I think I think yeah. the, like I think part of it is like human error is part of the game mm -hmm. yeah. now maybe that's not how it should be or I don't know yeah, yeah that's true I mean you will always have that argument of like yeah. This, this, all these regulations around um, trying to make the game more fair is making it just less fun, and you yeah. can just get rid of it. But I do think that um, there are just like low hanging fruit of um, if we can do, like, example is uh, the goal line technology. Yes, have goal line technology. The goal line technology is immediate and confirms it. is this a goal. Remember that goal in the World Cup? What's that goal? The Germany, Gerard? the England one? Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. the Rent Lampard goal. Lampard, Lampard yeah. goal. That's, uh, that would never happen. That would, that's an injustice that should yeah. not exist in yeah. the it's soccer like a today. And a half. It was yeah. so bad. If you can implement that on um, the entire pitch and see if the ball's out, the game, the game yeah, against Ajax. Yeah, it's already there on the goal yeah. line yeah. right now. Yeah, game against Ajax, we don't have to like look at this camera angle that's not on the line and yeah. try to determine if the ball's out. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, we have it immediately. I think that going forward, we're going to have the ability to um, have that more seamless transition. Um, quickly check, oh, there's a, there's a foul off the ball, and you can have just like a team of individuals looking throughout the pitch seeing if there's like fouls off the ball and just like notify it and have a, a seamless transition so we have a quick game that's not oh, we have to look at every single thing mm -hmm. but it's seamless and um it's just like an, an extra set of eyes so we're not just like relying on three sets of eyes to see everything that do you uh, would you prefer that like do you think over like not having vr well i think like right now we're kind of in like an in-between where it's you know, before it was like no VAR, normal system. Yeah. Now it's VAR with kind of still three referees. And then there's like hyper VAR with a Thomas team. wants hyper VAR. I want hyper VAR. Like a team of officials. Yeah. Like, uh, here's everything. here's my... Well, because that's like the least like, you know, you have the least... That's the least amount of like human error. Or the right, because it's a... It, whatever. it might get... Ambiguity. It'd be a tough system to implement to reduce just like a bunch of like... A, like a hierarchy like bureaucratic just like systems where it it gets like really slow but in ideal situation here's my what i get pissed off the most about get is, pissed off Tommy. is when referees um either a don't call yellow cards because yellow cards are you don't really think about it unless you're playing fifa and they have a little yellow <laughs> indicator above your player um and then you don't want to foul players they are kind of just like the underlying um, indicator of uh, how a possession might go. It's it's a variable you don't really think about. You think about how the quality of players, the system, the tactical system that's being implemented. But if you have a de defensive midfielder that is on a yellow card that can't, you do a tactical foul on a breakaway play. That is a severe disadvantage. And like throughout the game. Like certain most usually center mids, but like key players, center mids or um, defenders get yellow cards and are unable to s do tactical fouls that really prevent. Um, tactical fouls are just like absolutely destroying. Um, they just destroy a, a, a build up. Attack, yeah. Yeah. Right, but they're, I mean, yeah. That's why it's tactical, though, I feel it's like. It's tactical. But what does 
what is the rule around tactical fouls? The rule right now, what it seems to be, is if you are have like space ahead of you, but there's still defenders, and you pull someone back, that's a tactical foul, you get a yellow. Um, but what about if there's a player still kind of in front of you? Let's, all right, let's say there's like a two-on-one on one side of the pitch, and the rest of the pitch is totally free. Right? Two, two attackers? Let's say there's a pitch with four players. <laughs> I, You guys are defending me and mm-hmm. on one side of the pitch, and uh, this a guy named Jerry is on the other side <laughs> of the pitch. He is free. If I pass him the ball, yeah. um, he's basically free on goal. Mm-hmm. I turn. I kind of turn back in order to start passing to him, and you tactical foul. I am not. Uh, I can. I, uh, this might be a little crazy. Um, if I pass him the ball, I'm. He's through on goal. That's you. That should be like a tactical foul. But the rule around it is like if you're not kind of breaking away into space, they don't call a yellow card. Yeah. And what I want, what I really want, is a team team to evaluate the position of every every foul, the position of each players, and the percent chance that play is going to result in a goal. And analytics teams are starting to do this um, retroactively on um, older games. They can say, oh, there's a ball at the center back. Everyone's in position. This play, there's probably a 1% chance this play is going to result in a goal. There's a free header inches from goal. There's a 100% chance it's going to result in a goal. Um, So I feel like there needs to be more standardization around what situations yellow cards come up and once a player accumulates a certain amount of um goal probability taken away Mm -hmm. they get a yellow card because now let's say there's a 50 percent chance of you scoring a goal i tell you you're sure you get a yellow card also if there's like a 10 percent chance that there's a breakaway i tell you you're sure it's the same it's the same punishment yeah. there should be a threshold one to reach it based more, on or more colors or more colors <laughs> no. yellow no, be, orange and red yeah. there should be a threshold once you reach it no. you have that's a rose color foul come on that's very gentle <laughs> it's more of a, a, tea, a turquoise yeah. oh, yes. um what do you guys think about that so let me just sum up for it yeah so there should be they should evaluate how bad the foul is. How much. bad the foul and in terms of how uh, how much it decreases their chances of scoring. Right, so when you accumulate 50%, that should be a yellow. And mm-hmm. when you accumulate 100% of a chances goal. taken away, that should be a red card or something. It should be different because... Or like, something, well, just something, something just, it, Yeah, yeah. And so, is this only tactical fouls? Like, this has nothing to do with... No, yeah, this, this is... Yeah, basically. I feel like it should Or, like, be, any foul, because yeah. any foul is kind of a tactical like, foul. 50%, you know, a tactical yeah, okay. would just be, have a lot higher. Yeah. So I think, like, just hearing you all say that right now, that seems so far-fetched. Right. Because, like, there's nothing like that right now. Um, but obviously, you could say about that about the iPhone before it was out, you know. Um, revolutionary. And so, Thomas, <laughs> Thomas, you are. <laughs> no, but I think that's probably, like, the way things will go as VR is being implemented and... You know, it seems like the easy next step was would be to put like a wire on the touchline to know if a ball is in or out. Yeah. Um, and then fouls would be kind of the next big thing. You know, they're spending so much time on the offside rule right now, not really focusing on fouls too much. But eventually, they're going to get there. Um, so I don't think that's you know that far fetched. And I think it is. I do kind of like the system where um, you know I don't. You know, like the concrete numbers are not really important, but I, I think I like the system of, you know, the accumulation of fouls or the percentage of those fouls. Um, I don't know if I like it, though, just because it's like so. It is very, like, quantitative for right. like a, That's what like I, a yeah. fun game, you know. Yeah. Um, and it That's doesn't take it into account. Um like foul, like cards you get for um, non tactical fouls, like That's what time wasting, etc. Yeah, um, like- but it's it still frustrates me when because it, we're leaving up this um, just like incredible counting task to one person, the referee, of accounting for number of fouls, how um, bad the fouls were, and everything. And it's like I, I see the players sometimes 
come up to the referee after a, a player had just like two fouls in a row and they're like that's the second that's the second next one we, yeah. we gotta give him and like stuff like that i feel like they sometimes give arbitrary um yellows off of number of fouls which doesn't equate to how it those fouls impacted the game i feel like sometimes the referee needs some help in terms yeah. of uh, like the accounting of like how rough those fouls were and how they impacted the game and help them at least like give out yellows to players that deserve to get a yellow i th- I think it's so. I think we have to one recognize how difficult it is to be a referee because, like, oh, yeah. it's incredibly dif- difficult. And man in the middle, we yeah, man in the middle, like that show, like we can see exactly like what referees have to deal with. And I think there's a stat that's like they get ninety five percent of like their decisions correct, but like we only nitpick and talk about the ones they get wrong, obviously. Yeah. Um, and so. The, the whole tactical foul thing for me, it's like, I, I think for me, it's too quantitative because I think there are factors that maybe you can weigh in a certain way, like analytically, but like momentum and then like, just like, I think there's like a human aspect to like, you can kind of like feel the game as a ref, like, where is mm. this going? Is this game getting out of control? Like, are people's like tempers like getting crazy? Like, do I need to give a card here and like talk to people and like chill out? Because then for me, otherwise, if it gets too analytical, I feel like it's all like, like, okay, like you just stopped a 47% chance or like, this is your fourth foul. You're at 38% or like, it would just get like, so like robot-y for me. And like, maybe, maybe in like some sports, like, like baseball, you could probably do completely robotic refs. Yeah. Because... It's like you have a strike box. It's either a ball or a strike. And then for the bases, it's either he was safe or he was not safe. But soccer is such a – it's, like, really up to, like, the person that's yeah, refereeing. There's a lot it. of it's variables so subjective. in every play. That's where I think it, like, gets me. Because I feel like as frustrating as it is sometimes that you don't get a call, like, that's part of the game. And I also, like – you know, a lot of people who don't watch soccer always complain about, like, oh, they flopped or, oh, they're, like, time-wasting or, you know, you see them rolling around on the floor. And, like, yes, that's also frustrating, but it's also, like, kind of part of the game. That's time management. Yeah. You know, there's no there's no timeouts. There's no, there's no other way to really manage the time other than, you know, falling on the ground and, you know, catching your breath a little bit. And, yeah, it is frustrating. They're running it. miles every single day. Right, so it's, it is frustrating to watch break. it sometimes. But I do think... Like, part of the game is a little bit of give, you know? And I think if, if that stat is, like, 95%, um, you know, if they can get VAR to get it to where it's, I don't know, 98 99%, and they help out with those, like, ridiculous calls or something. Um, but I think if, like, to get down to, like, you know, the that last 1%, I think it's just kind of too much almost. Um just because I do think it takes away some of that kind of give, which I think yeah. is important to the game and the fact that it is so fluid and it is. And like, think about like even something like a ref playing advantage, that's kind of up to his discretion. Um, and that's something that also could be like, oh, maybe he shouldn't have given it in that p- situation because, you know, whatever, there was this percent chance of this happening or something like that. But I think that's like one of the ref's biggest abilities to let the game be fluid and let it carry on and I think you know that's like a um, gut reaction he makes or um, she makes and I think that's important you know and I think that bleeds out to some other things in the game where their give is acceptable which I kind of like yeah I also like when you see games like referees all like they act differently so there might be one referee where the players know like I can get away with more like they'll, they'll let the game play like they won't whistle as much versus another ref might whistle like every single foul. And I think like, that's just like part of the game. It might not be the fairest, but like, I feel like also like life in general is not always like fair. (laughs) Wow. So deep. (laughs) No, but like, seriously, like, yeah, it's hard to make it like, so like, I don't know, just like so fair. Yeah. And also like with, with VAR, like, 
we've seen i feel like we've seen decisions where var has like gotten it wrong still and whether it's like with penalties or something or like they didn't like that one arsenal penalty like against city or something where it was like a blatant thing and they didn't even review it Mm -hmm. i was like this is why we have var and they still didn't like look at it and it's like i mean you're not going to be perfect but when you have something like that and there's still problems like i don't know what's an issue i feel like they just need to get the time down yeah that's my biggest complaint the, the yeah if there's like some type of max and there's not like players walking around or waiting and it kills like momentum and flow of the game, I feel like. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah, they, they sixty needed, seconds or less. They need to delay the broadcast so that <laughs> it cuts <laughs> it all out and we can still celebrate it. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. They can just figure it out. Everyone in the stands needs goggles. Yeah, if it's <laughs> if it if Vieira uh, like decides no goal, um, they just cut it out from the yeah. broadcast. Yeah. We just like keep on going. We don't know about it. Yeah. The chance never happened. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, my foul boy is like I, that's what I was saying is it was like not really an ideal because you are implementing like so many people's opinions and like analytics onto the like, game full time. But I do think that you can sort of educate and use the analytics of um, evaluating certain positions as um, helping referees understand uh, their biases and when they give yellow cards that aren't um, deserved versus um, when they, uh, and vice versa. Yeah. I think it, I think that's much more of a um, solution that keeps the integrity of the game and keeps the human aspect in the game but still tries to solve the problems of um, what I just like my problem with the, the yellow cards yeah. of just like ambu- ambiguous and um, just a lot of accounting going on in one person's head. Yeah. That's why I need the, the two, the two person agreement. Two person my agreement. My system. We All gotta right. come up with a name. Okay, for FA, that. here we go. The this is our bar. Yeah. Dual bar. Yeah. Dual bar. Triple bar. Uh, password authentication. <laughs> Two factor <laughs> authentication. <laughs> yeah. They each have a key. Yeah, exactly. What is that called? They each have a key. I don't know. Nuclear, Nuclear bomb. Yeah, that's what's going I don't know. Agreement. Um, all right, should we talk Chelsea and Bayern? Yeah. I'll start with Bayern because I don't think there's quite Not as much. Too much. Um, I don't know if you guys watched the game, but every time, like, Tolisso, when he's healthy, he plays so well. He scored, he's, right? Yeah, he scored. He <laughs> actually scored twice, but one of them was offsides. But. When he's healthy, he's like the perfect backup to Goretzka. Like I bet he'll go in the summer though. Yeah, they're still talking about it. And apparently he's willing to be the backup, but one, I don't know if Bayern's okay with that because he does get injured so often, and two, I don't know what his wage demands are. But I bet, yeah, maybe he'll leave. Yeah, and then also it looks like Sula is gonna leave, right? Yeah, Sula's leaving. But, but where? Well we don't know, right? Bayern is that's a loss. Ser- beer- yeah, that's a huge loss. Yeah, I think it's insane. a huge mistake. And they offered him a contract, and he just didn't accept it. But German international for Bayern, he's like one of the best defenders, like statistically. I don't know what the stat was, but in in the Bundesliga. Right. Really? Yeah. And and he's such a good like ball pro- ball, uh, ball progressor. Yeah. He's so fast. He's light on his feet. Good passer. He can play right back. Yeah, versatile. He's huge. He can play right wing. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Put him up. Top. Put him up. Well, Byron, Byron played such a weird because Davies is out, right? So they paid, played like a back three. It was like Hernandez, Sula, and Pavard, and then Open Meccano came in later. But <clears throat> it was them three, and then up top it was Lewandowski, Sane, Muller, Komen, Knabri up front, which is like crazy to watch. <laughs> but, um, or Hoffenheim. Yeah. Or Hertha, or, Berlin. Or, yeah. yeah. Really but 3 2 5. Yeah, much. it was yeah, it was a three two five <laughs> or a three two four one, I guess, but yeah. Nice. Yeah. Good all, stuff. Good all stuff. Good. Yeah. All good in Bavaria. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um yeah. Chelsea, I mean, they did get the win against uh Tottenham. But it seems like even with the win there's just more so much bad news coming out of Chelsea these days. Yeah. Um and talk briefly about that game. Um Ziek Masterclass. That was one of the today. best shot outside the box shots because it wasn't even like hard it floated in it was like it was, it was like a basketball like swish yeah 
Actually, that's a great analogy. Well, because, yeah, it, like, it just, just, like, like, went into the net. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you haven't seen it, look it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> yeah, so I thought, like, that was, like, um, crazy shot. But also, like, his stats pulled up on the screen. He had the most pressures and most tackles of the game, too. Yeah, he was Which is absurd. Great, yeah. As, like, a right winger. And Ziyech is, like, a twig. But he had the most tackles <laughs> out of the game and the most duels won. Mm-hmm. Like, what? Yeah, Rudy was on the absolutely. field and that happened. Like, <laughs> um, so I thought that was pretty impressive. Um, a pretty good performance um, for himself for vying for his position within Chelsea um, was pretty good showing out of him. Yeah. That being said, we can talk more kind of outside the game. Can uh, we beat anyone other than Tottenham right exactly. now? Yeah. <laughs> can we beat any question. other one than Tottenham? Also, like, what... Who... This question is still out, like, who should be starting up top? And, like, mm-hmm. who should our attackers be? I don't know if you guys have seen, but it did say that there was kind of a lot of frustration among the attackers yeah. um, not feeling good and kind of some of them saying, okay, I might want to leave Chelsea yeah. um, because they don't like Tuchel's system that it's not playing their abilities or that it's so, you know, who's going to start is different every week. Um, they did say part of it was that they've been like so on top of each other and getting like, they're with the same people all the time. Like literally just like not even playing, but just proximity even. Right. Um, for the, you know, with a slight break over the summer, but if not, like, two years straight almost. And yeah. so they have this week off now, which I think hopefully will be good. Um, yeah, I think two goals apparently... Space. No, <laughs> seriously, and I think Tugel, like, recognized that and gave them a couple, like, a day off or something just where they didn't have to be together. But right. Because yeah. I think they're, like, probably just, like, getting annoyed at each other. Yeah. No, I did, see, I did see that report. Yeah, I never think about that, but, yeah. Yeah, I did see that report how, like, the attackers were... I think... Maybe they're frustrated with each other, but also frustrated at Tuchel because I think he was like very like berating them in the practice in games. Like he's apparently very hard on the attackers, and a lot of them were getting like frustrated with that. Yeah. Okay. I I heard that too, but I feel like I mean yes, there's different coaching styles, but you're playing in the Premier League, getting paid so much money, mm-hmm. and you're not scoring goals, mm-hmm. and you're not playing well, and like yes, Tuchel could probably coach them better to help build up their confidence but at the same time you know like these guys are our age most of them even yeah. they're a little just a little bit older so i do understand their position yeah. or, you know i can attempt to understand their position and their frustration but at the same time like score score like, that's what you're being paid <laughs> yeah. to do and you're not doing it on like yeah. as flat out as that can be um yeah. and think about like like i don't know how he compares but Think about how Mourinho or Antonio Conte, they got to be, like, howling at their players. Yeah. Antonio Conte takes um, throat lozenges after practice because he's, like, he's so dry from yelling at them no, constantly. I'm, yeah, I, like, I'm not surprised on that. Yeah, no. yeah, he, he, uh, he hounds them. And Antonio Conte, when he was working with Lukaku at Inter, would just have one-on-one sessions with him constantly, just, like, teaching him how to play with his back to the goal. Mm-hmm. And they would just, like, do that for hours. Right. Like, They're players, coaches. Anyway. Yeah. And I can see how they'd be frustrated, not, like, getting frustrated but f- because he's yelling at them is kind of like, come on. Mm-hmm. You can get frustrated because he's not using you correctly. Right. Which I think is much more valid. Um, but, and... Yeah, I think Pulisic came out today um, with an interview saying he's like slightly frustrated, but how how he's being used and like a random, he didn't like say he's frustrated, but he was yeah. like it's tough to play in so many different positions, and he's not like progressing like his career isn't progressing like it should be. Um, yeah, but see, like I, that's a valid point because we've talked about him how he's playing left wing, right wing, left wing back, right wing back, yeah. and, and striker. striker and false nine. So yeah. that's I like. For him, I understand that, and that's why I'm hoping um, that they can just like pick a formation or like pick a for- not no not even pick a formation pick a formation that works for these players mm-hmm. um, and play them in their positions. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that I think will come through. Slight but. blame on Tuchel for not figuring out the best positions for our top three attackers, and yeah. part of the blame is on our board for not letting Tuchel buy. A d- defensive mid and a backup wing back, and right. now we're in, in this position. And the reason why we're playing this like four two 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 is because we don't have um, recent wing backs. So we don't have backup center backs. We we just need to play. Yeah. 
um, more atta- we have more attackers. So he's like, oh, we have to switch up the formation to put four attackers in instead of um, three. So yeah, and I think that's like the, another side of that, or I guess a progression of that thought is that a lot of these defenders are out of their contracts and leaving. So I think hopefully that'll give Tuchel a chance to actually buy who he wants. You know, he's, I think if he doesn't get Jules Kounde yeah. either this window or definitely over the summer, I think he's going to be yeah. so furious because. Um, you know, he wants to build his system. Yeah. So he's I, wanted him so long. Too. Yeah, and that's like, I feel like that's the only player I've heard that, like, Tuchel wants. You mm-hmm. know? Um, and they gave uh, Lampard so well. He was been a success. Um, so I think, yeah, I think they need to back Tuchel. And I think one thing that is important is, you know, we've talked about how Liverpool and Man City are so good. And they've had these coaches for a long time. And that's not Chelsea's normal. Um, you know, process. But we haven't won a Premier League in a while. City have won a bunch, and they've stuck with, stuck with the same coach. They've been able to build a system around this coach and build a team that, even without Pep, they have such quality that it looks like it should go on. Yeah. Um, so I think Chelsea could do that. And at least, you know, maybe we don't need him for six years or whatever, but at least back him through a window and give him what he wants. Um, and let him sell who he wants to, you know, like, yeah, you don't let him have a, uh, whatever, yard sale. Yeah, get but, rid of. But if you need players. to, if it, if you need to sell someone for him to get another player, I think that's what needs to be done mm-hmm. if we want long-term success. Yeah, I feel like the board is still in this mindset of the pre-financial fair play era where Chelsea were just, and pre-Man City era where we were just dominant in terms yeah. of our... Um, spending and that could win us championships. It can't win us championships anymore. You have to spend correctly and um, yeah, build an actual team yeah. based on a system like Pep and Klopp. Yeah, now we have a hundred million pound asset that is just depreciating in the <laughs> Um yeah. Okay, so just quickly, like, who would you guys? I know we talked about this before. Like, you wanted to t- sell like Timo, I think. Yeah, so, so I think, like, yeah. What so would I, you do? Like, I guess, like, realistically, I think probably two attackers are going to be sold this window. Um, whether they want to leave and this they This window, force, like, no, 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 summer? Over the summer. Whether they want to leave and they're forcing themselves out or or buying someone else. And, you know, there's not enough room on the field for them. Um, so that's a good question. I My two would be Timo and Hudson Adoy. And I think the latter one is a little bit um, tougher to take just because he is a Chelsea academy graduate and whatnot but he, neither of them have the output you know both of them are good on the field Callum is incredible dribbler um, he's great on the ball he has good energy but he doesn't score and he rarely gets assists same with Timo I think that that's what matters yeah um, for an attacker so I think those are if you're going to sell two that's who I would yeah. that's why I pick also because um, I do think they both have pretty high value. That you know, they're both worth more than Ziek. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's true. I'd sell Hudson Odoi, and um, honestly, it's tough because Ziek is in such good form right now. And I think, I think that these conversations are kind of um, built around who's in like form week to week. Yeah. Week to week. Um, but I think Tuchel needs to pick either. A winger formation or a striker formation. Like, if we're gonna do two strikers and a more attacking mid, mm-hmm. I'd like to see that where it's um, Lukaku, um, Kai, and Timo as the strikers and Mount as the more attacking mid. Um, that means there's no room for Hudson Odoi or Ziyech. Ziyech more because Ziyech, he, he can play little, attacking mid. Yeah, he can. Like he can ride the bench a little bit more than someone like Callum right. should be just based on age and Callum, you know, should have a bigger career. Yeah. So if what, it's hard to say, but I think we should sell Pulisic if we're going in that direction because he is more of a pure winger. Yeah, that's where he, that's per- um, but the flip side, if we want to do, we, we could do a winger formation. We've had success with that. Then sell, I guess like Timo and, um, yeah, just Timo. Timo's yeah. so loved. But, no, I Timo love Timo. Timo was like yeah. loved by so many Chelsea fans. Do you see that thing? He was like, 
He's like, sometimes I don't understand why they love me. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't score. score. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and score, like, yeah, so me. that's good for the fans. You know, they're showing them their support, but also... Score. <laughs> dude, like, yeah. yeah, that's a pretty big flag. Yeah. If he even knows that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Kai is someone who's kind of a little bit strange because he, you know, hasn't really had the greatest time at Chelsea. Um, we did sp- spend a lot of money for him, but I think he's someone you got to ride, ride out the hardship yeah. with. I think he for the amount of money that was spent on him for his age and for his potential i think he's worth kind of giving a little bit more time giving yeah. an extra two or three years even. and his um ability to play striker and yeah. attacking mid yeah. and he, the, both those yeah i and feel like, like yeah Abramovich loves him apparently or he was the one who wanted him initially right um, kai is such a unique talent like he's so like I can't even think of like a comparable player, honestly, because he can't Ra- play striker. Ragnar called him the next Cruyff. <laughs> I mean, kind of, honestly, kind of, but like Cam striker, like somewhere in between there, you know, yeah. it's like where he can kind of like thrive. It's great as a false nine, and yeah, yeah, I think that run we had with him as a false nine makes me um, think he's. We can't tell him because that yeah. that is a run of form that we want to replicate and he might be the answer over no, Lukaku. If, if we yeah, and if we can get him to play like that and also just put Lukaku in front of him to actually help finish off those chances. Yeah. Let's yeah. start trying to do nah. what? Well this let's is start, this is also our um, application to Roman Abramovich well, for us to yeah. get you, hired by Chelsea. Yeah. Well I was just gonna say you should bring this up assistant coaches. You should bring this up uh, in the meeting with Toho tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> just like, you know Yeah bring it up it'll, it'll be a good. Thursday good morning interviews yeah. With yeah. we actually have to catch our flight soon that's true <laughs> to London <laughs> red eye to person. London like in, in person meeting um, alright well I think that about does it that good was up. great good episode gentlemen I don't like what <laughs> <laughs> uh, alright well thank you everyone for watching and listening and we will see you next week thank you peace boxes <laughs>